So, hello everyone. Today, during this speak, we will speak about malware classification, rootkit detections on IoT devices using side channel and more precisely, electromagnetic emanations. So, all this work has been funded thanks to the ANR ANA, where the goal was to side channel can help against malware. And it was owned by Anneli Isa. The main contributor of this work is Dewey Fook Fan. He made this work during this nice work during his PhD. He's now a threat intelligence and malware researcher at Trellix. He's a malware guy behind this work. And I'm the side channel guy behind this work, and I'm currently assistant professor at Rennes University. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the our live today's presentation, it's going to be uh, the introduction, why we want to do on this topic, and then we will show you uh, how did we set up with all of the uh, acquisition, data processing, pre-processing, processing, and then the results. Um, and that uh, why this topic then? Um, yeah. We see um, the trending of attacks on embedded devices, IoT devices as well. The difficulties for the antivirus solution on IoT devices is because of the embedded devices or IoT devices have been constrained by the uh, resource computing power or the diversity of the devices. We have too many architectures on the embedded devices from ARM, from MIPS, PPC, and etc. Also, the IoT malware data sets is kind of lack in the reality as well. Um, uh, the topic is also about another way to detect malware. Uh, somehow it's trying to anti the malware detection evasion. Um, so before we dive into our talk, uh, let's take a step back onto the traditional of uh, malware detection or malware analysis. We always have uh, some of the kind with static analysis or dynamic analysis. Nowadays, we have interactive analysis where you pivoting the IOC, trying to enrich in your, your, your malware report. And all of those were to answering, I think, three main goals for detecting malware, saying the verdict of the malware. Is the malware similar to any other campaigns, any other malware family? Or to clustering or classify the malware, right? Um, but however, there are malware evasion techniques. For example, the static analysis from the yesterday talk, we have seen the more than 500 kilobyte bytecodes into one function and using control flow flattening, right? Those are the malware obfuscation. And malware packer also can evade the static analysis. Uh, for dynamic analysis, we have anti-debugging, anti-sandbox, and somehow in our research, we have a technique calling a side channel information where the, where the malware trying to read the sensor. For example, the CPU sensor, the, the CPU temperature, the fan of the computer, just to answer is that the malware is running inside a sandbox or just a normal computer. We have, um, nowadays we have many detection technology, right? EDR, XDR, but however, there are the evade of behavioral detection or the grab in the detection capability. So all of the techniques we see, they, it have one common point, that it relies on the device, relies on the software level of the device. So what about we step out the device and we monitor the execution or monitor the activities from the outside device, so regardless of what the device is going on, it's just a black box, and we monitor the activities from outside the device. So it comes to us to a side channel. So side channel has um, side channel has a long history. I think um, in the World War II, the German army successfully intercept the uh, telecommunication of the Allies by listening to the um, the ground current on Earth. Uh, and recently, we have. Uh, the Tempest from NSA, we have uh, um, Spectra, uh, Meltdown with the side channel attack on the CPU. We have some research that can just listening to the sound of the environment. 
to do a keylogger. So it's like uh, listening to the sound and predicting the keystroke. Um, so in this topic, we don't do side channel attack, but we are more into the side channel analysis. So um, from an embedded device, there will be uh, many side channels around it. For example, the electromagnetic emanations from the device, the power consumption of the device, the timing attack, or the sound, the catch attack, or the heat of the device that can tell you something about the um, activities that it running under the device. So in our research, um, we don't want to rely on the software, like I said previously. So we don't do catch, um, side channel attack, we don't do uh, power, uh, the uh, performance counter, but mostly we rely on the electromagnetism emanated from the devices. Uh, to do so, uh, we look into the state of the art to see um, how did uh, people in the research community have working on about the topic. Um, some of them doing the anomaly detection using the power consumption and the electromagnetism. But in our work, it's going to be um, classify IoT malware automatically by using the electromagnetism. So it's no anomaly detection, but this is malware detection. Um, the second thing in the state of the art is uh, it's still lack of the side channel detection for the real, real world malware. So instead of real world malware, mostly the uh, research was focusing on the uh, laboratory crafted malware. It's not something like uh, I found it on Vice.org, but it's more like a, a, a lab created uh, malware. Also in the research is still, um, there is a lack of the research with the malware that have been obfuscated, have been packed. So I think most of the research in the state of the art just uh, assuming that the malware is already unpacked and then they do the research on that. But in our, um, in our um, research, we're gonna do both the, the real world malicious one and the benign IoT data set and then we classify it and detect it as well. Um, so um, for the malware, when it's running on the device, obviously there will be malicious behavior. But what about the stealthy malware? For example, the rootkit. When you got infected, they just do nothing, right? They just sleep, just wait for uh, the command. Maybe a years later. Uh, so uh, how is going to work with our with our uh, solution? Like our solution is monitor the the, the electromagnetics. But what if the malware is a stealthy rootkit? So. Uh, we um, kind of doing a kind of a bet, just trying to trigger the behavior of the rootkit, but we're gonna dive into that later. So for the uh, framework overview, it can be divided into uh, three phases. The first one is data acquisition. Uh, we have a data set of malware. We generate also with uh, obfuscation and packer. We run it in the uh, synthetic user environment or the um, embedded device. And during the execution, we monitor from the outside of the device the electromagnetism, recorded it into the data storage. For the data pre-processing, pre the data, you know, like the data from the side channel or the EM, mostly the raw traces in time domain, we need to uh, convert it or short-term Fourier transform it to a spectrogram. We selecting the features and then feed it into the models with both um, machine learning and deep learning. All of the um, code and the data set of our work has been open sources, so um, just uh, feel free to, to have a look. Um, but however, in, the, in, our, in our research will also be consists of two, uh, consisting of uh, two projects. One is the AMA. The AMA is for, um, is for the malware classification, so it's like all kind of embedded um, IoT malware we take into the data set and we're trying to classify it. And then the second project is we call it Ultra, mostly focus on the rootkit detection. So for the Ultra, we only take the, the data set of uh, multiple rootkits and we do the detection on those uh, kind of rootkit. Uh, for example, in the AMA, we um, did a kind of um, a collection from the from the virus total and virus sign. We just take the uh, the most mostly used one, 
like the Mirai, the Gonagrai, root kit, uh, root kit, some rootkits, and the bash line. Uh, also, in t into the data set, we collect the uh, benign activities as well, uh, like just doing a random uh, Linux command or playing audio from the audio embedded device, record from the camera, taking picture, record video, encode video, and etc. Um, for the malware, after we got the native malware, we also do the obfuscation on that, like uh, adding the opac predicate, virtualize it, or control flow flattening, etc. and UPX spike as well. Uh, for the ransomware, we try to vary it by not only using the default uh, blowfish algorithm for the gonna cry, but we also add the AES and D uh, DES as well. So we have, we have like really uh, wide uh, variations of the malware collection. And for the rootkit, so the rootkit are collected for both the kernel space and the user space as well. Uh, the BNI activity is just like the same, just Linux activity, record camera, and doing any user I IoT devices. But also we're collecting the kernel drivers, the firewall, etc. because we think that those kind of drivers may mess up with our solution later, like we can just detect the kernel driver benign one as a rootkit, which is not good, so uh, we're also collecting those kind of things. For the rootkit data set, we collected um, seven different rootkits. Uh, you can see like they have uh, also a wide varieties of uh, different features. From hiding the file, uh, the uh, sniffing on network, keylogger, uh, rat, uh, local privilege escalation as well. Also some of the, the rootkit has been uh, obfuscated as well. For the target device, um, we wanted to, to have a kind of a, a, a device that can run as many um, possible malware, right? So uh, Raspberry Pi was uh, a choice, and Raspberry Pi was running on ARM. The other one we uh, picked was the Creator CI20, and that one is running on uh, MIPS. So we have uh, two architectures. Also the, ma the malware also we have been collecting can work on the two uh, architectures as well. Um, now, coming to how we uh, record the electromagnetism. Um, so for the first project was using, um, we were using the um, oscilloscope, we call it, uh, or it, it is the picoscope one. It's, um, it's kind of cheap, but not very cheap. Why? Because it costs uh, 10 grand for the oscilloscope. Uh, in academia, it's, it's like affordable, but yeah, it's not very cheap. This kind of uh, a standard device in the side channel community, and the device have been uh, monitored uh, in 2.5 seconds at two megahertz sampling rate, and we got around 200,000 traces, cost us around two terabyte of data. So after all of the experiments, we got two terabyte of data. And later on, with the, with the rootkit uh, project, we try to um, to be more flexible and adaptable, and like more suitable and affordable as well. So we move to from the oscilloscope to the SDR. So the SDR is like the, the software defined radio. It is very uh, portable and affordable. So what we got was the uh, Hack RF SDR. I think is about 200 euros only, and we recorded in 0 0.5 seconds in a two megahertz window. And finally, we got uh, more than 800,000 traces and cost us 6.6 .6 terabyte data is for, the, for the training the model. Um, the other thing with the side channel is that you need to have a trigger. So um, before you, you do the experiment or before you record the data, before you run the, the malware, you, ne you need to have a trigger to tell the data and also to tell the, the oscilloscope when uh, the record will happen. So for the AMA, it start at the beginning when the malware installa is installation and then we stop the trigger. So actually we recording the, the malware activities running on the device. But for the rootkit uh, solution, actually in here we are not uh, going to monitor the malicious uh, behavior 
of the stealthy repeat because obviously there's no behavior, they're just sleeping, right? So uh, we, um, we created or we defined a thing called a bit. So a bit is either a software or hardware st stimulus and have uh, three requirements. The first one is that we create a bit with the assumption that we don't know the modus operandi of the rootkit in advance. So it's just black box. We are not going to reverse engineering the rootkit, right? Uh, so the second thing is that the bit is gonna be um, a variable duration time. So uh, we can control the bit uh, remotely. And the third requirement is that it shouldn't be uh, distinguished from the common benign behaviors. So it should be running just on an unprivileged uh, execution or just running on, on user space. So just an, a normal activity. And the malware cannot uh, distinguish the bit that this is something like a sandbox. It's not a sandbox actually, but it's not a bit or it is a bit or not. Um, for, so for example, this is um, a very traditional rootkit thing. In the left side of the screen, this is uh, a system call interception of the, uh, the, the system call of the queue. So from the user space, it's called a queue. It called an API queue, and it called to the kernel space the system call of the queue. But in the right side of the screen, when uh, the device got infected by the Diamorphin rootkit, uh, the queue API has been overwritten by the hack queue, and over that it has a switch. If the signal sent to the queue command is one of the three uh, different signal, it can be to hide the process ID of any process in the user space. It can give the root permission to the lower level of the, of the device, or it can hide the module of the, the rootkit itself. It's just like hide itself, right? Um, so all of those signal will go before the real um, queue system call. Uh, this is how the diamorphin hook into the system goes. And with our bit, it will go onto the, onto the red line. It just go, we don't know because we, we just assume that we uh, don't reverse engineering the, the rootkit. So when we have the bit, we just call a normal queue. And those queue will go to the red line. Just don't go to any um, malicious one. But however, that switch, that signal switch is cost about 14 lines in assembly. Yeah, it's a very tiny piece. But when we do with the side channel and we run it multiple times. Um, classify or can understand. Reason it did not work at all. Think that these bandwidths are more information that we can use. We just for detail, we use a pretty huge window and also a huge overlap in order to defeat the problem of, of desynchronization. But the problem now, if we go to this, we can't fit the classification algorithm because the data is too big and it will slow down our analysis and does not scale. So what to do with this? It's something really usual in side channel. We will do feature selections. And also known in classification algorithm, you will not use all the data, but you will select some point on the 
on the STFT representation, so the time frequency representation. And since we know that we had some problem of resynchronization due to not really accurate uh, triggered, we select full bandwidth. And the NICV, that it's pretty known uh, techniques in SciTunnel to to get like which bot has more influence or is more linked with the class we have. And so we just take this, take the max of the NICV and select this bandwidth. So we can have, a, we can sort the bandwidth by influenced by the, by our distinct classes. So what we did is just extract this bandwidth and try to classify using only this bandwidth. And so for Anna, we just take one bandwidth, try to classify, add one, add two, add three, add four, and when we reach the maximum, we stop during the training. And for the ultra, we, were, we developed a more smart method, like we try to add one, we try to add another one. If the, the accuracy decreases, we re remove. If it increases, we keep, and we keep going until we tried all the, the bandwidth with a limited number in order to, to fit and to be able to compute everything. And <clears throat> before going to the result end of the classification, uh, obviously, the, te the result that I will present is on testing. So we compute, we take all our data set, we take a part for the learning, we take another part for the testing. Obviously, there are no overlap between both. And yeah, that's it. And so now, let's go to the classification. We use two usual algorithms, so machine learning algorithms, the SVM and the naive Bayesian. And we also handcraft two small uh, deep learning algorithms, one MLP and one CNN. When I say small, it's we just have like three layers. I've, if I well remember, we have some additional slide if you have a question on it. And we also add some other for the machine learning in order to speed up. We use some reductions of dimension algorithm. So for the classification, so for AMA, we use the kernels uh, LDA, while for ultra, we use PCA. And for the deep learning, we did not use any CNN for ultra because we get really good results with MLP that it's uh, quicker to execute the CNN. The CNN is uh, the one that takes more time. So we choose to only uh, Naive Bayesian, SVM, and MLP for Ultra, while for AMA we also used uh, CNN. Here, the first results that I will present for the classification. So what we did, the first scenario we tried is, can we classify the family of the malware, just giving a trace, extracting the bandwidth, and giving it to our model? Can you classify well or not? I would say, yeah. We reach for the Raspberry using the CNN, we can reach 99%, more than 99%. And with the CI20, so the MIPS, uh, we get 90, more than 96% of classification. We can see the distinct class and which population is in each class. So it's six distinct family. Then we wanted to try something. It was uh, the step just before doing uh, detections, because here it's only classification since we, we, all, we trig the installation. But we, what we did is we removed some sample from the training set. And we, so it means that the model never see, for example, when you see the gonna cry family, you never see the AES UPX1, or never see the, uh, the gonna cry AES. But can you classify it as a gonna cry? I would say yes again. For the CI20, we reach more than 99%. And for the, uh, no, sorry, for the CI20, more than 29%. While for the Raspberry, we reach 96%. Here we can see that the MLP had better results. We think that because the CNN over, over learned, the, the, the sample of the learning set, so it can't really well classify the samples that you never see during the testing. 
And uh, last for the malware classification before going to the ultra results on detections here, we wanted to see if our models can say if uh, which packer, uh, which obfuscation have been used. So we can, the results are less than the, the other experiment, but we still have good results on seven distinct classes. We can say with more than 78% which, um, uh, sorry, which obfuscation have been applied on the, on the malware. It means that recording the, just recording the EM, giving it to our model, we can say which packer have been used, which packer or which obfuscation have been used. And, oh, sorry, I forgot this one, also for classification, it's the last experience we did, it's can we say which malware is running? And yes, here we can see that we have a really high uh, number of uh, classes, so all the, all the distinct malware we have and all the distinct obfuscation we had, so 36, so 35, sorry, and we reached a pretty high score with uh, the CNN on Raspberry. I forgot to specify, but between the brackets, it's the number of bandwidths we selected. Now, here, a big picture of the results we had for the rootkit. So what we did here is we just ran a get in on the, on the device, we record the trace, and we record multiple traces like this. Some were infected, some with benign, and we compute the model, and we compute uh, one model per uh, rootkit. And so what we did, we compute model on each rootkit. So on the left is the rootkit we learn on. On the top, it's for CI20. On the bottom, it's for Raspberry. More, uh, it's blue, higher the score is. And so if you look here, it's when we try to detect a rootkit using the model of his own rootkit. So we compute a model with Burke, and we try to see if he can detect a Burke activity. And on CI20, with Naive Bayesian and kernel PCA, we reach 100%. And the ninth thing with the, with the super idea of Fook is when we do a bait, we can do multiple bait and mean and do an average of the traces that reduce the noise, and it means that it increases the, um, that give us the opportunity to increase the accuracy. And the nice thing also is, if we look here, using the Vlani model, so the, the model we computed using Vlani, we can detect also the other rootkits with 100%. And we also wanted, as folks said before, we wanted a kind of cheap, um, a cheap setup. So we tried to decrease the price of the probe. So on the right with the one, it's just a pen and, uh, and a ferret to accure the data, to accure the EM, the electromagnetic emanation. So the, f the second, the second number, it's the probe type, so the nice one and the, the expensive one is zero, the, the, the one, one with one is the cheapest one. And the other number is the probe position. It means that we take the same probe, but we move it a bit, and we try to compute a model for each of them, and try if we take the model with the probe position one, can it detect the probe position zero? I would say yes, it works well. But what about doing the acquisition with the expensive probe and testing on the, the cheap one? No, it does not work at all. But doing the acquisition with the cheap one, computing the model, and then testing with the cheap one works well, works really well. We reach 100% again. Here, yeah, this result has been done with the open bait and targeting the Burke uh, rootkit. And now, let's go for a demo. All right, uh, here's the demo of uh, the rootkit detection. 
if you see on the uh, downside of the screen, uh, is, here is the Raspberry Pi. That one is the Hack IF uh, SDR. We have an amplifier here connecting to the hidden uh, cord, and here's the probe. And at the moment, the probe is untouched to the, the processor of the Raspberry Pi, right? Uh, this one is the result from the uh, deep learning model. It's running on the server. And this one is SSH uh, session on the device. So um, I'm, 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 what I'm doing right now is I'm trying to uh, installing the Diamorphin rootkit by uh, using the sudo insmod of the rootkit. And the rootkit has the feature to hide uh, the file. So if a file name like uh, Diamorphin Secret, then it will be automatically um, hidden from the folder. Yeah. And also, um, yeah, I, I also to making like some activities, some noises. So in case like you wonder, it's like we don't want to do like just the rootkit on the device, so it's obviously easy to be detected. But we want to uh, do also activity as well. So what happened when I just connect the probe? I just move the probe here to touch on the processor of the Raspberry Pi. So you can see here, it's, uh, at, the mo at the moment I record the, the traces. It's not been optimized yet, but you started to see that the model with around 0 0.5 seconds of uh, real time just continuously monitoring the EM here can say that the rootkit is detected. I'm also trying to do some uh, local privilege, privilege escalation as well. Uh, so at the moment we are at the Pi, the Pi user level, but we're trying to get to the root to just to confirming that the rootkit is uh, activated already on the device and just do some stuff and then just read the ETC shadow, so we got the root. And still, the verdict is saying here, in real time, it is uh, detected. And after that, I just remove the rootkit right away. You can see the verdict just saying that now the result is just clean, it's not infected anymore. And the whole thing was recording outside the device. We didn't install any Asian here on the device at all. Now, let's conclude. So, first thing, Ama and Ultra are full, fully open source. The data, the code, feel free to use, to fork, to modify. It's here to, to play with. And we investigate real world scenario. And it seems promising, since we have like 100% of detections with a limited number of samples, we know. And the fun fact, it's uh, not usual for academic paper. We get like, some media coverage, but uh, take care when you read it, because some of them say that we were using uh, Raspberry to, with a probe to detect on your own computer. No, we never did it. And the fun fact, if you open the, the first paper, one picture is a Raspberry Pi with a probe on top. I don't know what they did. And uh, the perspective now, uh, one really nice thing that could be, that re would be really nice from my side channel point of view, it's how to identify really when the, which part is really used for the classification. Because we, we, we can say in the STFT, but not in the time, really time domain, where, which part is really used. Uh, increase the data set. Uh, an upcoming thread like EBPF rootkit, doing a standalone uh, with uh, just a uh, <coughs> Jetson NVIDIA. This thing has been done by some students. Uh, I'm teaching, so I give a project that they try to use and to do it, and it works with even lower number of sample, but they did it well, and it could be really nice to increase this. And here it's all the publication we did on this topic. Feel free to go, you can access online for free. And uh, uh, also the super thesis of Fook that is also available online.
PhD thesis. PhD thesis, sorry. PhD, yeah. And uh, thank you. So, do Dr. Fouke and uh, Professor Damien, <laughs> thank you for your talk. Um, we will take one or two questions. I'm going to catch up. I got one up there. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you for the amazing presentation. I didn't quite get all the parts about the spectrography side of things, but I just wanted to know, since you take the assumption that you don't know how the wood kit uh, works, like you, you took diamorphine and I, don't, I think a couple others that are available on GitHub, though I think you can simply just go get the, the information on GitHub, but if you take a wood kit that you don't know and you don't want to reverse, how can you be sure that the baits are triggered? Yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think to do so, uh, we need to list all the system calls. And for each system call, we compute the model for every system calls. So uh, if the rootkit is unknown, and hopefully this is a kind of a, a Cisco hooking rootkit, and if we have the models for more than 200 Cisco, and then I think hopefully we will catch the, the rootkit. Yeah. Last question. Thank you. Uh, awesome research, awesome presentation. I have many questions, but I'll just ask one. <laughs> Why did you choose that uh, frequency for S SDR? Does it have to do with the frequency that the CPU runs? And does CPU frequency scaling affect your uh, acquisi data acquisition? Yeah. So I'm going to answer this. So uh, yeah, this one is also a good question. It's uh, kind of a hidden work in our work to how to find it. I think um, the result when I got it, it's pretty quick, but it took me around one to two months to find the right bandwidth or the right frequency. So what I did was I scanned the hole from zero to two gigahertz. And each of them, I've, I took like uh, each of the frequency, like I did only a chunk of two, gigahertz, uh, two megahertz of it from zero to two gigahertz, fitting it, it into a very simple deep learning and picking the most accurate one. So uh, in theory, it should be uh, related to the processing, uh, to processor uh, frequency or double it, but in, uh, in our experiment, it's, it's totally different. The number of, uh, of, the, of the frequency was, was different. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.